Why do we get into cold water? We get into cold water because it sucks, but we know it's going to benefit us in the long run. And it's the same thing with these subjects and these conversations. We got to mm. dive into that cold plunge, get uncomfortable, talk about this shit so that we can all be freed from it. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Today, we have the wonderful Justin and Emily Baldoni. That's right. What a pleasure it was to sit down with these two. Uh, we got pretty deep with them, babe. We did. Right out the gate. We did. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. It's fun because we have a lot of mutual friends, but this was our first time meeting Justin and Emily. And the reason for our discussion was Justin's new book called Man Enough, Undefining My Masculinity just came out and it's a really interesting book. We have a lot of conversations relevant to this. What was the inspiration behind this? Um, If you are familiar with Justin, he is kind of a fan favorite from the show Jane the Virgin. Mm -hmm. He has also gone on to direct movies like Clouds, which is famous for bringing you to tears (laughs) and also Five Feet Apart. Anyway, Justin has a stellar career and he's really passionate about this subject of kind of evaluating what it means to be a man. He's given several viral TED Talks on it. He has a lot of YouTube series about this. And that's the inspiration for this book. So I really enjoyed our discussion. We talk much about this and also religion. And we, we really got into it. I think one of my favorite parts about this conversation with Emily and Justin was talking about how their relationship came to be and how difficult it was from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And kind of their perspectives and viewpoints on why relationships should be difficult and the beauty that can come from it. Yeah, they had some really uh, unique wisdom and insight. And I appreciated them taking the time. We definitely pushed the time limit with them. We Uh, did. We we, did. We ran it right up to the last minute. But anyway, if you want to find out more about Justin and Emily and what they're up to, including Justin's new book, uh, we'll link that as well as some of his TED Talks as well. Please check them out. And before we jump into it, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show and give it a rating on whatever platform. Uh, we really appreciate it and love hearing your feedback. Ready to roll into it? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's do it. Justin and Emily, true pleasure to have you on the show. I got to say, we've been binge watching your uh, episode that you did with people on YouTube, your house tour. And I want to ask, did we hit the infrared bed this morning or is that yet to come? You mean that juve light thing? Yeah, the juve light. <laughs> no, we did. Did we? This morning was like <laughs> pressed early, and if I would have done it, I would have woken her up. She would have thought that she was being abducted by aliens. It is so, so bright. <laughs> oh my god! It terrifies the neighbors. We're it's under awesome. Thing. We're under construction right now. Uh, we moved to the country. We're up here in Ojai, and so we haven't built our master bedroom yet. So we're building a section of the closet where we can hide the juve lights so that it doesn't bother the other person. Awesome. Uh, or That's our awesome. neighbors who think that we're into some weird, freaky stuff, I have a feeling. They're like, our whole house closed. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> oh, man. I got to say, I feel like you and I would vibe pretty well. I am like a, a tech geek or like smart home. Any cool gadget that you can have in your house. Dude, I'm looking at the toilet, your cold plunge bath. I want to buy it oh. all. I need it now. Bro, I got you, man. You guys <laughs> got to come up. You got to come up and I'll take you on a tour. I'm just the biohack geek, man. I love it. The <laughs> challenge is you got to have the time to do it. Yeah. It's, not, yeah, it's, it's all meaningless unless you actually use it. Yeah. That was one of the first things Andrew was like, did you see the cold plunge? Did you see the infrared? I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. You could dial in the temperature of your shower to the exact degree. Wow. I would love cool. that. You know, I would love that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. We don't have it here at this house, but that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. The cold showers are freezing though up here. Yeah. The cold showers are like a cold plunge. Well, it's mm-hmm. nice to meet you guys. Yes. So yeah. nice to meet you guys. Thank you for <laughs> having me. Yes. A congratulations is in order. I want to reiterate, Justin, on your new book, this right here, Man <laughs> Enough. I'm honestly pumped about this because I feel like this is extremely needed. So if you wouldn't mind, we usually start off a little differently, but I would love to kind of have you talk about your book uh, starting out the gate here real quick. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, I'm excited that you want to read it because it's really uh, written for men. It's a love letter to men. And um, Man Enough, uh, Undefining My Masculinity is really kind of a meditation on what it means to be a man today from a, from my experience as like a straight, white, cisgender dude. Um, and what I'm looking to do in the book is to invite men into their stories by like showing the raw brutalness of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, So I get deep and gnarly and talk about stuff that we don't normally talk about as men, a lot of early experiences, sexual experiences, um, ways that uh, masculinity as a whole has 
not just hurt me, but cause me to hurt people that I love. And what I'm asking that we do is we really start to ask why, to question the system, to question what it even means to be a man, what our socialization has been, why we act the way that we do, why we engage in certain behaviors, why we interrupt the women in our life, why we take up more space, which is I'm trying not to do as I'm sitting here next to my wife with my, leg, with my legs spread open. <laughs> why, why, today. why, today. why, why, why we cut ourselves off from our emotions, why it's mm. not okay to cry, why, why we use the language that we use mm. so that we can unlock our potential to become not just good men, with good humans and more full, happy, healthy, loving, kind, empathetic humans. Because hmm. uh, that's how we change the world. Well, it's powerful. The titles are brave enough, big enough, smart enough, confident enough, privileged enough, successful enough, sexy enough, <laughs> uh, loved enough, and, and dad enough. And uh, I got to say, I got the book. We turned directly to the sexy enough because I was oh, like, okay. I want to, yeah, yeah. I need to uh, check yeah. this out. But it was, it was actually powerful. I mean, talk about like, a lot of different topics, including porn, including the average size of a erect penis. And it's like, you kind of, you, you really do just get right after it, which it's funny in a society where, you know, we're used to seeing penis enlargement ads and all these different billboards and things that you could find at your local grocery store that I was reading these facts and I felt like a little uncomfortable, which is ironic in that sense, because of sure. we've kind of, yeah, it's, 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 we've been brainwashed to like almost expect mm. the other side of things as opposed to what the truth actually is. So it's powerful. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm, it's, it says a lot. That's the chapter you turn to, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is. yeah. yeah. And it's I, important and it's a cold plunge. Please go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, I love everything about this. I can't wait to read it. We're getting ready to have a son, but I feel like there's so much of that that's been depicted for women, like mm -hmm. for so many years that, Nobody's really covered the guy's side and it's so important and it's a conversation well, it's that also, needs to be had. Yeah. It's also because if you think about it, women have had to have this conversation because mm -hmm. women are the oppressed in this situation. We are the objectified, sexualized party here and we are the ones doing it to you. Mm -hmm. So you've had to, for the sake of your sanity and mental health and for community be the ones that are engaging and starting these conversations and saying, this is not okay. It's mm -hmm. not okay that you're doing this to me. Mm -hmm. It's not okay that I'm objectified or sexualized or as you know, Emily shared early on, like having boys comment on her body before she even knew what anything was like, I mean, this is the culture that we're right. all raised in. So, so now what I'm just trying to do is say, well, it's kind of a chicken or the egg situation. We wouldn't be doing it to women if we didn't start with ourselves. Mm. And and as uh, my dear friend Liz Plank says, she has a book for the love of men. Your liberation as a woman is tied to my liberation as a man. And so that's the purpose of this book mm. is like, as men, we got to start asking these questions and going deep and unlocking these hidden truths, these, uh, these taboo subjects and topics that make it uncomfortable for us to talk about things like body image or body dysmorphia or sex or porn or all of these <laughs> things. Because... The, the longer that we don't jump into cold plunge, the more we're just going to suffer. That's why I kind of call it the cold plunge, right? We just bring it back to like, you, you were fascinated about my cold plunge. Why do we get into cold water? We get into cold water because it sucks, but we know it's going to benefit us in the long run. We get into cold water because it's a mental endurance exercise to know that we can sit in freezing cold water despite the discomfort. When we get out of it, there's bliss and there's joy. Our endorphins are, are, are rushing and we're happy. And it's the same thing with these subjects and these conversations. We got to mm. dive into that cold plunge, get uncomfortable, talk about this shit mm. so that we can all be freed from it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that because I, I, I could see potentially or someone looking at this and say, well, what are you trying to do here? Like make me feel guilty as a, as a white, you know, straight male for something I'm not in charge of, but really the goal is to have honest conversations so that we can all be better as a result. And in your Ted talk, Justin, you talk about, you know, the, the analogy of the bird with uh, bird has two wings and it can only fly. Yeah, the quote from the Baha'i faith. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, share that if you don't mind. And the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha says that humanity can be likened to a bird on one wing is female and the other wing is male. And it's mm -hmm. not until those wings are equivalent in strength that the bird can fly. And at the moment, my words, our words are that the bird is grounded. We're not flying yet. We're not even, we can't even take flight. Yeah. We're not even, because the wings aren't equivalent to strength. Mm. 
Yeah, it, it is powerful. And you mentioned uh, there as well that how can we prevent the situation where there has to be millions of females uh, abused or neglected and then them have to stand up and say, me too. Uh, how can we prevent that from having to happen again? But it's been cool to, uh, on, on that note, to see you and your relationship with your wife, Emily, uh, which has been documented. The engagement? <laughs> My gosh, dude. What the heck, man? How many dances do you have to learn for that proposal, dude? I think, well, yeah, we did a few. That was just a big, <laughs> that was just a big, like, uh, very ambitious. <laughs> but that was but that was also analogous to our dating story yeah it I, was i was loving her <clears throat> in the way that i wanted to be loved yeah the, and i mean the proposal <laughs> video was him making fun of how he loves to just do everything so grand everything mm. is big everything is like it has that wow effect and that's the opposite of who i am i like the smaller intimate moments you know i don't need the fireworks mm. so that was him kind of making fun of what he loves to do and how he loves to express his love and then ending up with giving me something that that is more that is closer to my heart you know an intimate moment with us mm. and our family um and it was my journey of failing through it all because that's what that's what our dating with, life with was each like big was, surprise yeah it was a you know because every time i would and i write about this in the book <clears throat> you know i would do these grand gestures that would just fail miserably i feel and that nobody ever got to see me fail at them because it was just this feel painful that. awkward terrible like uncomfortable <laughs> dating experience and uh, so so when it came down to propose i'm like all right the way to do this for me is I always wanted to do a big grand gesture proposal. I had thought about that before I even thought about the woman that I was going to be with. Mm. So now I found the woman and she doesn't want that. She doesn't want that. And so I, so I did all these grand things and I suck at them and I fail at them and I'm making fun of myself to get to where we really needed to be, mm. which was, I got to love her for her. Um, and the way she wants to be loved, not the way that I want to love her. Mm. To backtrack a little bit, the way we usually start out the podcast, I'm very curious how you guys met <laughs> and how the whole dating process started. Um, it's funny. You put, it, you put it on our website. You should tell that story. Our, our, date, our, our marriage website. Yeah. So it's hard to keep this short. We're going to try to <laughs> jump in. Um, so he did a movie in Costa Rica in like 2007. It was a really bad movie. Um <laughs> Uh, I think there was a there was a uh, some sort of production company that bought it. They they thought it was going to be great, and then it turned out to be a huge failure. And then they decided to do some reshoots of that movie to kind of fix it to save it. And then the guy behind the movie he was like, "No, I'm just going to raise more money and shoot the movie all over again." Jeez. He wanted Justin to be a part of that second version of the same movie. He said no because experience had been so bad. I was cast in the second movie. Had he said yes, we would have played boyfriend girlfriend in that second movie. Wow! He didn't. I started dating actually the guy who did play my boyfriend. She has a type. <laughs> um, I have a type. And then so that's how we met. I think we met at the screening of my version of the movie. I was just leaving uh, leaving the party, and you were uh, with, with, entering the party with that dude. Yeah. With that dude, and you showed up with your girlfriend. <laughs> that's where we met in a the doorway. Dude who has no name. I love this. The dude. And there, there was like yeah. nothing there. It's like, oh, there's that guy from the first movie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Um, and then we kept running into each other in some weird ways in, in town in L.A. We we were in the same acting class for like two classes, not for very long. Yeah. And I was like, oh, there's that guy again. He's really good. Um, we were both in relationships. And then finally, in 2010, we ran into each other at a, <laughs> at a JC at an I, audition. I, I, the story, the story it's is in the book. The whole thing's in the book. The whole thing is in the book. But at a <laughs> JC Penney's Christmas commercial audition, which I hadn't been auditioning for commercials at the time. And I was super depressed because I had just been cheated on. Mm. And uh, it was the week before I shaved my head. I went full, I went, you know, full Britney Spears <laughs> in that moment. And, um, <laughs> and I, uh, I shaved my head and felt amazing uh, doing it. But right before I had met her at this commercial audition and I was four hours late or something to the audition and we kind of looked at each other. And as it turns out, she had also had the same thing happen to her that week, but we never talked about it. Wow. We, we were kind both of nodded at just each very other. Very broken hearted. Just people. broken people. And that year I went on a deep spiritual journey 
really connected back to my faith. She went on a deep spiritual journey. And a year later, almost to the week, so I got 2011. 2011, I got a random call for an for a commercial audition. Again, I'd maybe gone on three that year for a JC Penney's Christmas commercial audition. And this time I showed up like four hours early because I could give, I didn't give a shit. I was just like, oh, this will be fun. And there she is. <laughs> the only first person I see. Thank you, JC Penny. And I'm like, <laughs> and I just for the first time I saw her. I was mm. single. She was, but I like saw her and it was like time stood still. And I write about that moment um, in the book and loved enough. Mm. And, uh, and we just started talking and it was almost like we were like being pushed together at that point in time. Now, it, it didn't just end up great. After, it wasn't like happily ever after. We were pushed together and then the work started and it was actually very hard. That was shitty. Mm. <laughs> our, yeah, our, we, we, didn't, we didn't have a honeymoon out. phase at all. But that's how we kind of, that's how we met. Um, it was thanks to this, like, you know, these two terrible movies. Her movie wasn't that much better than mine. It was not better. Uh, I agree. But it was because of the same people that were making it. It was literally the same movie. Our wedding, our wedding uh website right. like where it says like our story showed both trailers of the movies <laughs> it's amazing and you can see they use footage from both of the movies in the trailers they're just uh, oh my gosh and it was just really sweet it was a very hollywood-esque uh story that was really it really came down to timing and divine timing i think at, i think at the end of it Today's episode is also brought to you by CBR, the Cord Blood Registry. If you have been a couple things listener for a while, you may have heard us mention Cord Blood Registry when we were pregnant with Drew. They're the leader in newborn stem cell preservation and for good reason. They have world-class facilities and a team of experts who do everything they can to ensure your newborn stem cells are safe, secure, and available in the future if you need them to protect your family's health. And they don't stop at preservation. They are actively investing in research and clinical trials too. Storing your child's stem cells today could give you access to the scientific breakthroughs of tomorrow. And they're working to make sure those breakthroughs actually happen. That's right. If you aren't familiar with CBR, their team uses these tiny cells to treat over 80 diseases and conditions like sickle cell anemia, leukemia, and other blood cancers. But what's really exciting are the possibilities for the future. Yes, because newborn stem cells could end up helping a lot of conditions that are far more common to us all. They are being studied for their role in regenerative medicine and could be used to help immune disorders, tissue damage, and even conditions related to COVID-19. CBR collects your newborn stem cells with your baby's cord blood and cord tissue when you give birth. You only have one opportunity to do this, so enroll to get your kit today. This is something Andrew and I put so much time and research in with Drew, and now we are doing with Little Man. We highly, highly recommend it. Harness the possibilities by going to cordblood.com right now. Use code CPLE to get $500 off collection and a free preservation kit. Once again, that's code CPLE. Go to cordblood.com and get your free preservation kit today. We're also gonna link that down below. That's a big discount. It is. Let's get back to it. So there was a lot of work right out the gate, even when you're dating? Yeah. Wow. Why do you sound so confused by that? I, uh, well, I feel like in dating, it's, it's a little more honeymoon phase-ish where you're like, oh, yeah. this is great. Well, yeah. Like, I, let's go on adventures together. I actually think that's refreshing though, because it's the first time we've heard that, but that's actually how marriage is. So I feel like all dating experiences should start that way. What, really rough? Just yes. throw people I, right yes. in the fire? I, <laughs> say, I say this in the book. I literally, you're, so you, you got to read Loved Enough and we have to have a conversation afterwards. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, I feel please. like with dating, you put on such a facade for so long and you're just trying to impress each other and you're trying to like, you just BS, like BS your way through it pretty much. Mm. And then you get into marriage and you're like, oh my God, I'm stuck with you. Like, let's figure this out. I'm glad that's how you feel, man. Glad <laughs> yeah. that's how you feel. Okay. <laughs> um, on, on the days that I, I don't like you, I yeah. love you always. Yeah. But no, it, I, I feel like dating, we miss that because- Yes. Whenever you get tired of each other, you go home and it's like, oh, I don't need to see him today or tomorrow. Well, marriage is different. Mm. And mm -hmm. I love that. I love that you guys worked through it before you got there. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's good to have a balance because it's been it, it was also very hard for us to have that much work to do so early on uh, when we had so little foundation to stand on. But I totally agree. It's so important to do the work. Dating can absolutely be fun and all of the things that it is. But if you don't start the work until you get married, I mean, this is why so, mar so many marriages and, and relationships fail, 
because people are not ready to do the work. They're not willing to do the work. The grass is greener and it's just like it starts. And I am really grateful that we had that opportunity to just be like, oh my God, we're such different people, but we want to be together. So how do we make this happen? And then we made it happen. It's probably the, it's why there's never been a question in our marriage, no matter what comes up. There's never been a, is this going to work or not work? Yeah. There's there, because we've done such deep work from the beginning. And it's funny, but, but it's funny that you were like, it's so, that's so interesting that it was hard at the beginning because we have this myth that dating should be a thing that we should have a honeymoon phase. Right. But could we, is it actually good for us? Look at, look at our divorce rates, mm-hmm. look at, look at, and the, and the marriages that make it, how many of those marriages are actually happy or are they staying together for kids or for other financial reasons? Mm-hmm. Is there, is there really joy and, and love in a lot of, a lot of marriages today. And we have to ask ourselves, are we marrying the right people? And how do we know? And so it kind of goes back to our faith. Like in the Baha'i faith, we're told that, that we should be investigating character. Right. So no matter who you are or what you are or what your, your sexual uh, orientation is or your gender, it's like, well, how are we dating? Are we dating from the outside in or the inside out? So yeah. we should be investigating one's character while dating. And I make a joke and loved enough that Forget about like honeymoon phases and forget about like romantic first dates and trying to sweep people off of our, you know, sweep people off their feet. Like all these Disney movies have brainwashed us to do the -hmm. the best first date. You want to have like a real uh, Mm -hmm. idea if you're going to be with the person do therapy. Can you imagine if we normalize that shit? Like, can you imagine if like the, if a first date was a therapy session and we're like, Hey, let me get all my shit out on the table. (laughs) You would just, you would know pretty quickly. if This is the person that you want to be with. But yet what we do is we just prolong the process. We fall madly in love with each other from the outside in. We confuse ourselves with all of the dopamine and the sexual hormones. We replace conversations with sex and physical intimacy. And then we end up with somebody that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then you finally get married. You have your honeymoon phase. It's awesome. The sex is great. We're together. And then shit hits the fan. And you realize you have no foundation and you have to build it in real time. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, it's like living in a house while you're building it from the ground up. How do you live in a place where you're trying to build a foundation? Right. And that's why marriages aren't working, especially today in this on-demand swipe culture. We're not truly getting a chance to experience another person's trauma. And Noe, one of our best friends, she, mm-hmm. she, I remember early on, she gave me the best, an, the best analogy for what marriage is. Marriage is two people, each with lifetimes of shit and trauma, Buying a plot of land and just taking all of that shit and the trauma and just dumping it in the front yard, <laughs> throwing it in the front yard, letting all that shit fertilize the soil and then building the foundation to your house out of it. That's what marriage mm-hmm. is. You can't do it if you don't if you're if you're if, if you don't know what somebody else's trauma and pain is. You can't do it if somebody else doesn't know themselves or is not willing to do the work. And as mm-hmm. we know, one person can't do all the work. It's got to be right. two people, but that's not acceptable today, which is why we get reactions, right? Like you, mm-hmm. where you're like, well, that's, uh, so, so tell me about that. That was so interesting because mm-hmm. we're not used to it in our culture. Mm-hmm. We're not used to like just showing up messy and vulnerable and being mm-hmm. like, all right, let's, I'm interested in dating, but you know what? I was abused when I was a kid and I got a lot of sexual stuff and I'm, you know, we don't have those kinds of conversations. I'm not, I'm not saying myself. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. As we know, one in five boys are abused. So oftentimes men never, ever admit to those things. Wow. You mentioned, did we marry the right person? Or do you have the belief that there's like one right choice there? That's a really good question. This is a deeper belief. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have one version and you have yours. What yeah. Well, what do you mean a deeper belief? Well, I think it, for me, it ties back to spirituality. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was going to say, no, I don't think it's just one person. I think you can absolutely make things work with more than just one person out of how, however many we are, 7 billion people. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I also believe, again, to go back to that deeper belief, I just think my feeling for us is that we are truly meant to be together. Of course, it could have ended up differently, but I feel like there is such a strong purpose here that it's almost like it just this just had to happen. 
Um, and I believe that there is like just a lot of, I mean, we, we believe in so many weird things. I don't want to come off as sound. Well, that's what I was trying to say. It's like the deeper, it's like a deeper thing. <laughs> it's like, I believe the strings are pulled, right? It's not just up to what I want and what he wants. I think that there are strings being pulled. Let's just keep it to that for now. Um, there are powers that work for us. Well, I kind of want to say that. Okay, go, go for it. <laughs> okay. So we believe, so if so Baha'is, we believe that, I'll give you the short, the bridge version. Is that this life is a workshop. We're spiritual beings having a physical a experience, and and this is and like the womb. In the womb, we have everything that we need. We're growing. We're developing. We're we're growing eyes and ears and arms. We're in the womb. We're we don't have, we have no choice of what we're doing there. We're just there. And then one day we're born to this world, and we need everything that we were developing. We need our eyes, our ears, um, and and we have a use for them. We have use for all of these things, and then we know we're going to die. And one day we're going to die, and we're going to be born into some other place. We're not going to have any use for these physical things. We're only going to need the spiritual things, our spiritual eyes and ears, trustworthy, honesty, you know, love, kindness, steadfastness, all of these virtues. But in that place where we're going next, this is our spiritual belief, which is a world of its own, heaven, whatever religion you are, whatever you want to call it, there's an existence. We know energy cannot be created or destroyed. We believe that you can influence this world. Just like we, you right now, 28 weeks pregnant, can influence the brain of your child, your son that's in your belly. You could play classical music. You can talk mm -hmm. to him. We know scientifically that when your son is born, he's going to be able to understand the language in your voice as you've been talking to him, right? Well, we believe where we go next, the same thing can happen. So we have a spiritual belief that her father, as an example, um, has really guided us and brought us together. My friends who've passed away, I've been making documentaries about people who are dying for a very long time. Um, and, uh, and I have a lot of friends, wherever that is in this next world of existence, who I know are guiding me and helping me and pulling strings every day. And sometimes mm -hmm. our loved ones open doors, but we have to walk through them. Or sometimes doors open and they'll whisper in our ear that you should walk through them. And sometimes that looks like when things are really dark and you're dating, and at least with us, there's a little bit of a pull coming from somewhere else that keeps us together saying, now keep going, a dream something like that. And we've experienced a lot of really cool moments where we feel like we're being guided and escorted mm -hmm. by loved ones and friends and family who have already passed on and reminding us that there's a bigger reason that we're together and to get past our own trauma and our own shit. So forgive me, I'd actually never heard of the Baha'i faith until uh, I watched the, the video of, I think it was something you did last week with uh, like an interview about the the faith and it was it was interesting so I actually was just as you were describing that thinking about uh, finding Nemo the movie when they jump on the uh, the Australian the the little the river current eastern Australian <laughs> yeah. where it's like where maybe but the am I right in saying the Baha'i faith doesn't believe in a god as much as like a continuing legacy that that you're you know, in the no, stream the of faith believe, no, the Baha'i faith believes in God, <laughs> mm -hmm. but not in a guy in the sky with a beard. Yeah. Okay. So we believe that God is an unknowable essence and that but how could we, our finite minds will never yeah. understand something so infinite. So, exactly. You know, how could we ever picture in our minds the, a thing, a being that could create the universe? Cause we right. don't even understand the universe. We don't know where it begins and ends. We have no comp like time. Mm. How can we examine, like imagine a world where time doesn't exist or, mm -hmm, or, or picture something that created time. So we're not able to fully comprehend it. So we assign God these attributes like he, she, it, whatever, but God is kind of exalted really beyond that stuff. And mm. if you, if God is the sun, then God sends rays to warm the earth. And those rays are the prophets of God, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, these types of teachers who've come from the beginning to educate us. So yeah, we don't. We believe God is is bigger than a thing, and it it and it will blow your brains trying to. Trying Basically, to that our relig religions fundamentally agree. They're mm -hmm. all. We believe that they're all talking about that same essence, that same mm -hmm. God. We're all one. Yeah. It's funny to to watch you two interact. Uh, Emily provides such color to, to like yeah. almost encouragement uh -huh. as as you're talking, Justin. It's, it's pretty great. Uh, I would like to. So on on the issue of working in a relationship. What comes to mind when I think of that are things like actually taking time for self-reflection and self-awareness and then 
probably the next step after that is taking time to improve, you know, faults that I become aware of, whether that's through that self-reflection or through marriage, you know, or someone who knows me intimately. What's that balance for you? How much of it is marriage or how much of it is you realize? <laughs> uh, I feel like 5% are flaws that I found myself. 95 <laughs> <Yeah>. are what? <laughs> That's what I was getting at. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah. But then they'll come back around to be ones that you've created, like you've uh, come across on funny. your own. That was funny. He'll never accept it. For, it's from me, but it will be implanted really? in you. Yeah, no, so, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> No, 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 he no, does. Alex, he Alex, does. Alex, he that does. was a joke. But we were, we were uh, on your, you, you have the Man Enough uh, interview series on your Wayfair uh, YouTube channel. And I know we have mutual friends in the Huffs as well. Derek's great. But actually some of the best uh, perspective that I've gotten was from Mark Ballas. Uh, and he says, dude, whenever your spouse or your partner gives you uh, advice or gives you a criticism, like critique, a, like hopefully that's coming from a place of love from them, but also you have to, as a receiver of that, honestly evaluate the, the truth of that statement or the truth of that criticism there, mm-hmm. you know, cause very rarely do I just uh, receive criticism from Sean where she's totally off base. It's like most of the time she's actually right. Like she might've delivered it in a way that hurt me or uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe amplified some things, but it's like, no, there's something there that I should look into, you know? And having the self-reflection within arguments, within criticism, within a marriage of however you deliver it comes with baggage and you have to learn how to communicate that and sift through that and say, okay, I delivered this poorly because of my own flaws, but I'm delivering it because of this reason. Yeah. And because I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ram Das has a really great quote, and I might be butchering it now, but it's something like this. Um, he said that I can do nothing for you, but work on myself. Mm. You can do nothing for me, but work on yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's such truth in that, because when we do that work on ourselves, deep, deep self-exploration, like, <laughs> like Justin's book right here, it was pretty deep. Um, but when we do that work, I think it's easier for us to, when we see something in our partner that we don't love or doesn't quite work, then then we can approach them with compassion mm-hmm. because we know how broken we are ourselves. And we like, I know my trauma. I know my crap. I know you have yours. So let me bring this to you in a way that doesn't like stab you in the gut um, because I know that's not going to help. I know what that feels like. Mm. And that way we can also, when we get that, um, not criticism, but like feedback from our partner, we immediately know that there is some sort of truth in that. There is some truth in what they are bringing to me. And I am willing to look at it as I'm looking at all these other things. So I just feel like self-exploration and work on ourselves is like, oh, it's it. It's it. And then after that, it's communication. Talk, talk, talk. Yeah, so there's an there's an article with the headline of uh, with you two. We fight every day. Quote: <laughs> Justin and Emily Baldoni share relationship ups and downs during quarantine. But in it, you say uh, that bait. you've in some ways kind of mastered communication. Can you talk about what your systems are, or what your patterns are, or what you found helpful or or hurtful? Seen, luckily, I don't Google myself because you're like, what interview like, was what that? What interview was that? I don't yeah, know well, I've never said that. I don't know. You, all, you always so, have to love like the one line that they piece together for like a headline. It's always like, so, okay. okay. You should Google all yourself, all Justin. There's some good shirtless oh. pics, dude. You, sh- you might come across, you know? The last oh, thing I need. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Especially when you read chapter two, which is not big enough, the body image issue from head yeah. to toe. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, I have a lot of body image stuff. Go ahead, my <laughs> love. Um, what was the question? Uh, you, oh, communication. And, and, yeah, yeah. How, wh- what have you done well? What have, yeah. Fight every day. Um, no. I, I would actually say I was not a very good communicator until until Justin. I'm the kind of person who can absolutely go to bed angry. I almost want to <laughs> go to bed angry. Just like pull that grudge, and he's like, "No, no, no, no. We're we're talking about this until we can like love each other mm. and spoon <laughs> and feel like we're okay." Um, so he's taught me a lot there, but I feel like communication, especially in marriage, it means more than just talking. It means, um, authenticity and brutal honesty, not just with your partner, but with yourself. It's like, 
how do we talk in a way that we can come from love um, and kindness and also staying true to ourselves mm -hmm. and honoring ourselves and being authentic. And also communication means that you better be a damn good listener because that's without that, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, that's just been, it's been practice. I don't know how to perfect communication unless you just practice and practice and practice. Well, it's like anything else. I mean, you guys are athletes, 10,000 yeah. 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 know, you don't get good at something by just showing up and then trying it once. Today's show is brought to you by Verb. Babe, are you loving your park dates with baby girl? They're literally my favorite thing. It's so <laughs> fun to watch her get a bit braver every time we go, whether it's on the play set or her talking to other kids. She tries something new every time we go. I do have to say though, that chasing around a toddler is no joke. <laughs> right? These past few weeks have felt like a lot, but I think I have found the best product to crack the code on the afternoon slump, which is Burb Energy Bars. They are the freaking best. I definitely packed one for the park today. And if you don't know about this brand yet, they have created great tasting bars that have the right amount of caffeine in them to help you get through that afternoon workout or in our case, chase a toddler around the park. Plus nutrition side, the snack bars are gluten-free, plant-based and have as much caffeine as an espresso, but the caffeine comes from organic green tea, mm. which means you get a smooth, long lasting energy boost without the jitters. And they taste amazing. I know, they have the delicious flavors like cookie butter, double chocolate, salted peanut butter, peppermint mocha. My favorite, my I was gonna say my favorite. Is, oh, is, is, is the double chocolate. Mine is definitely salted peanut butter. Okay, that one also is delicious. And we're excited that we've worked out a special deal for you, a couple things listeners. You can receive 30% off Verb's best-selling bundles. It's a great way to try their most delicious flavors. All you have to do is go to verbenergy.com slash eastfam or use code eastfam at checkout to claim the deal. That's V-E-R-B-E-N-E-R-G-Y.com slash eastfam. This discount is only valid for their bundles. So go ahead and try them out. We're going to link that down below too. Let's get back to it. I feel like I, I know the answer to this because you guys have shared a lot of how you've just decided to work through a lot of things from the day, from day one. But you live in an area. We lived in LA for many years. Love it there. But mm -hmm. where divorce is rampant. I mean, people are so quick to to leave each other and say you're not the right person and the grass is greener, everything like that. And healthy marriages are almost, I don't want to say people look down on them, but they're just like, oh, that's just not going to work for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. How, how do you guys prevent being like that? And how do you live within a culture in a world where like we do, you're almost like an outlier? Yeah. How do you prevent being like your peers, you know? Um, well, first of all, yeah. first of all, we now live in the country. <laughs> mm. uh, we don't live in LA anymore. Mm -hmm. We've moved our family. We have a bunch of acres out here in Ojai, California. So we're staring at it at the beautiful Topa Topa mountain range and our tiny house. Yeah, we're in uh, a little yeah. tiny house. Love house it. Right and the fridge right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's for us, we, there's, I keep wanting to go back to faith because Mm -hmm. For us, none of it exists. No, it, none of it, it doesn't happen without faith. So that's where we're connected, right? So her, even her wedding ring, there's three rings on it. Mm. There's um, her, me, and the big one in the middle is God, right? Yeah. And, and I think just like anything in life, especially in marriage, the why has got to be bigger than the two of us. At any given point in time, either one of us could destroy this marriage mm -hmm. easily with our own egos. Dang, I got chills. Yes, yeah, it'd be very easy with, her abandonment issues Dang. with her father, with my codependency. I mean, we could destroy like, this thing in a heartbeat. To be really honest with you guys, I had a moment just the other night. I was like, and this is really honest. <laughs> but like I was a wet puddle on the kitchen floor and I'm totally, cause I had a really big self exploration journey which brought up a lot of things. And I was like, I'm not good enough for this. Like you would be so much better off without me. Totally in my wounds. And I just had to express it. Never, Luck never. Like, luckily, I mean, first. luckily I was aware of, I was like, th these are my demons talking. I know that, but this mm -hmm. is why I'm crying so hard. Cause I feel like I should not be here. You know, like you would be, you would get everything that you need if you weren't with me, you know? And I think, and I think it's important to say that that just happened 48 hours ago because we are not perfect. The work continues. Mm -hmm. That was a very low moment for me, but I still have him. And we've been together for almost 10 years. 
So there and has to moment, be room and non-judgment around that, that those things will come up as we commit to work on our trauma and our wounds, right? But then it's like, what do we do to get, yeah, <laughs> to pick it, that wet puddle off that the moment, floor? Even when she's in that place, I'm on the floor with her, reminding her that while she might not feel enough, she's everything I've ever dreamed of. Mm. And it's the fact that we can even have the conversation if she feels safe enough to say these things while saying, this is not how I feel. These are my demons that are coming out. And that's the big difference. Right. We so often don't know ourselves enough that's to true. distinguish between what is our ego and our demons and our trauma and how we actually feel. There are two different paths that we take in our minds. And she has the wherewithal because of her deep, mm. deep work to know, I don't feel this way. This is what my demons are telling me right now. And I want to say this out loud. And I'm saying, tell your demons, thanks for sharing. Mm. But I love you, not despite all of your trauma, but because of it. You're my person, 100% of you. I bought into you. Mm -hmm. and I love that part of you, that trauma, that, that stuff. Your abandonment issues are a part of you. And I love those too. Even though those hurt me, those manifest in behaviors that can hurt me and cause me trauma, you would not be who you are without it. Mm. She wouldn't, Emily wouldn't be who she is without her father being an alcoholic and passing away young. She would not be the woman that I'm madly in love with. So, right. right? Yeah. So I think it's really important to then think about mm. the bigger picture. And I want to go back to faith, which is, that is the thing for us mm -hmm. that always keeps us together because it's not even an option. It's like when you, when you recognize that you are a spiritual being having a physical experience, then regardless of what comes up in a marriage, it's not that big of a deal. Mm. Because at the end of our lives, if you flash forward to being 80 or 90 years old, our marriage is going to look very different than it does today. And the issues that we're fighting about now are not going to be the issues we're going to have when we're 80 or 90 years old, mm -hmm. you know? And so we just have to put things into perspective. We oftentimes, we have context collapse on the internet and social media, and we have it in our own marriages. Mm -hmm. You don't think about the big picture. And so for us, it's faith. It's it's the why, it's our children, it's love, it's, mm. it's, it's being in community together as husband and wife for spiritual growth and development. Our marriage, right? What is marriage? Marriage isn't just a good time. <laughs> We're married together. This is our gym. Yeah. We go to the gym together, yeah. right? So there's some days when I'm helping her. And I'm spotting her and there's some days where she's spotting me. Yeah. And as long as we're growing in one. that, like as long as we're growing in that way, then it's working. So at the end of it, like we, like we can have a moment like that, hold each other, talk to each other, be mm -hmm. with each other. And then the next day have the most beautiful physical experience of our entire lives because we're in it together and we're there. And that is what marriage is. But most people don't know how to hold it. And don't stick around for that second part. It's just like a cold plunge. Mm. How do we feel right. after we jump in cold mm. water? Because there's always a reward. You feel you amazing afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you feel amazing after you like dig into yourself and dig all that shit up mm. and you lay it out and you have this moment. And you know what? It might look messy. And I might be attacked. I might become a victim for a second. Who knows? But boy, if I can hold it and sit with it, if she can hold my stuff and we get out of that cold plunge, mm. boy, you feel like you are alive. Dang. Mm. That's Im that's really important. Mm -hmm. Everything you just shared right there. Thank you for voicing it so well. I could never have verbalized that. But uh, it made me think of, there was a Navy SEAL I was listening, talk to, discuss this concept of self-imposed suffering. And it's it's like similar to the, you know. David Doggins? Uh, no, this was Dan Crenshaw. Or maybe he was okay. a Navy SEAL. Yeah, he was a SEAL. Or he's a senator now, whatever. But uh, he, it's kind of like delayed gratification to some extent where like you can either take the immediate, uh, you know, easy route and and jump in the warm bath or realize that it's going to be better in the long run if you suffer a little bit if you uh, like voluntarily suffer and then the the feeling of repair and replenishment that you get out of the cold tub even though you went through that suffering is much greater but our um our next question was going to be about you know what was it in the other person that made you voluntarily want to make it work and <clears throat> First of all, it gets me pumped up to hear you talk about marriage and like this self exploration and, and self discovery because I feel like marriage is the best vehicle for that. Where it's like, just like we were talking about the cr criticism from other person, dude, you're looking into a mirror 
every single day and getting feedback. And there's no mm-hmm. uh, better way for self-improvement than like actually, you know, going through that yeah. process. But yeah. it's, I, I love what you said about, you know, these demons that we each have, the baggage that we each have is what makes you, you. And for you to say that it's not, you know, Emily's eye color or her laugh or, you know, the, the more Physical uppity training. things, it's, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. also the, the darker stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. kind of what makes it worth it. And that's the beauty that you see is really powerful because that way, when you are going through a hard time, I feel like you can actually point to that and be like, Oh, that's a demon. And you know what? They help make you, you. So anyway, right. That was deep stuff, dude. That was freaking deep stuff, man. <laughs> Dang. That's good. we live in that space. What we're working on next is we like it. the balance of also the lightness. Mm-hmm. Cause we kind of look at the last 10 years and we're like, all right, we've done so much deep work and we're going to continue to do deep work. And now this next phase of our marriage, we're both actively looking at, okay, it's one of the reasons why we moved to Ojai. We're actively looking at, okay, how do we bring a, more of the lightness in, right? It's like soil. Mm. Soil has all of these different layers right. and all of these different ingredients that make it rich. Mm-hmm. I mean, you need all of them in a full life and in a full marriage. And we've done so much good like work. Joy, adventure. Yeah. So that's the next small, phase. Small things and the big things. Yeah. Dancing I mean, that, that more is, and that like is just being more free and flowing. We've done so much of yeah. that depth, that deep work together. And now we want to sprinkle in, all right, what does more joy look like for us? What does more adventure look like for us? And we think that mm-hmm. because we've done so much of the foundational work, the joy is going to be richer. Mm-hmm. And that's like the next phase of our marriage, what we're looking at. Mm. Mm-hmm. Let me, this is going to sound ridiculous, but let me recommend e-bikes. If you have not tried an electric bike, it is, dude, it's the best. You guys will have a ball. So rent them out, try it. You, and see- it. Yeah, you don't out. live in the hills of Nashville. Yeah, that's so, true. California. We, have, we yeah. actually don't have any pavement here. We're all. Yeah, but there's a great bike path that in goes Ohio. all the way yeah. in Ohio that goes all the way down. We'll, to rent, Ventura, them. we'll rent the beach. e-bikes. We have, uh, Do it. We, have, we have, we have Rangers. We're doing it. We got the Polaris yeah. Ranger and the, and the John Deere Gators that we drive around. In our <laughs> okay, sick. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. I love that. So kind of a two part question, but transitioning into babies, you guys have a daughter and a son. Yeah, mm-hmm. five and a half and three and a half. Yeah, she, well, no, mine is almost six. Oh she, she'll be six no, in June. I don't want her to be six. <laughs> and <laughs> Maxwell <laughs> is three and a half. My little baby. It goes so fast. I felt like I so had fast. my daughter yesterday and she's almost two. It's yeah. crazy. But big question within the relationship realm, within everything that we've kind of talked about, what's the one thing that you would want to teach both of them about relationships? And then. Yeah, I'll I'll leave the second part after that. You go first. Ask me water, by the way. I know you. Yeah. You keep the, the, the problem is that when you take my water, you drink all of it. Like there's nothing. That's what he, that's what he does. And I, I love get, a guy uh, who appreciates hydration. I love that. I, no, but it's must hydration. No, I brought the, I brought uh, the glass in here. I pour the did water. Did you not notice? I took a super small sip on purpose because I okay. I know that. Great. And I'm and I'm not gonna finish cool. it. Cool. Do not finish. Justin, it. are you hydrated enough? That's the question. No, he's not. That's because the next I've been chapter. doing interviews since 6 a.m. and I'm so oh. amped up on coffee. I'm going to hear, if I listen to this podcast back, I'm going to be like, Jesus, Justin, slow down. Why are you yeah. so, I've just been drinking coffee all morning. I have a lot of energy. Day. If you were in this room with me, then you'd, you'd feel it. And it's and so I've just, I just want a sip of water, but I'm not going to take all your water. Thank you. I love um, this. I love it. The... Um, I didn't see her move the glass. I brought it over here and then she moved the glass and she put it as far away as possible. It's stay over uh, my side. Hmm. What would we teach them about relationships? Oh my gosh, there is so much. Uh, it's such a good question and such a hard question. I feel like, I, I think it's really important that we teach them the things that we that we just talked about, that it's, it's not about only honoring yourself and on, or only honoring the other person. Um, why can't I find the words at all right now? I wish I had your coffee brain. Mm. It's like, like know thyself, right? Yeah. Who's ever quote that was? Is that Shakespeare? Know thyself. Well, Baha'u'llah says, Baha'u'llah says one should know, man should know himself, what leads him to loftiness. Or yes. 
glory or honor. So to like to do that work and and as something that we can do when they're young is just to teach them mindfulness, which is like walking in nature in silence and then moving their bodies and dancing to different rhythms. And it's all of the things just to create that deep mindfulness of the present moment, right? Because in that, in that moment, you have the keys to everything. You can listen to the cues of your body, what your mind is doing, and, and you can just be with yourself. And that's what kids are so good at doing naturally. So I just want to keep teaching teaching them that right now, because that will then make it easier for them as adults to do that self-exploration and that self-discovery that we've been talking about. And when you do that work, you are just a great partner, whether that's a colleague or a wife or a husband or a family member, sister, brother, whatever it is, it's just easier to be with people that know themselves um, because they don't lay their anxiety on top of you to fix it. These are people that can hold it for themselves. And I think that is, is one of the first ingredients to a successful relationship, whatever relationship that might be. Mm. And I would also say that even though they do that work, they're still going to screw up. Oh yeah. And, like you, and you're and, human. And that's the thing. And which brings, which is my, what I would want to teach the kids about relationships and what I think you and I are are doing well is modeling the ups and the downs of marriage. Oh yeah. So but not I having think, to be perfect. I think our kids learn from us in two ways. They learn from what we say and they learn from what we do. Mm. So mostly often, from what we do. And it's the mirror, it's the combination of those things. So I often say my actions today are their memories tomorrow. So mm. some something that Emily and I have done is because you know, we've all seen those parents who refuse to fight in front of the kids. Or we've seen parents who fight and just don't hold back in front of the kids. Mm. But oftentimes what doesn't happen is the conversation about what the kids have witnessed. And kids are smart. Mm -hmm. They're these small two, three, four-year-old, five-year-old brains that take everything in. They are so much smarter than we give them credit for. And so what Emily and I are doing, and in moments where we're frustrated with each other, we voice our frustrations to the kids and say, mommy and daddy love each other very much, but mommy's annoying daddy and daddy's annoying mommy. And mm -hmm. what's happening right now doesn't mean that we don't love each other. And we talk about it. We call it out and we say, and guess what? You don't have to take care of us. You don't have to fix us because oftentimes kids will want to fix us, mm -hmm. right? A lot of damage is done in parenting mm -hmm. because kids grow up thinking that they have to fix their parents and take care of their parents. That's where codependency originates, right? Mm -hmm. So we try to teach our kids in the good and the bad, we, we express love and show physical affection all the time in front of our kids. And so sometimes we'll just like, I'll just grab her and we'll just kiss and our kids look at us and they go like this, <laughs> are you guys getting married? Because mm -hmm. every time we kiss, they say we're getting married and it's sweet and we get married a lot and our kids will grow up seeing that, that their parents also get annoyed at each other. Yeah. Also get frustrated and angry and that they don't have to protect one or the other because there's also balance there. And also we show love and we don't hold that back. And so by showing our imperfections, by showing that we're human, they can grow up having a healthy, balanced expectation and idea of what they can expect in a marriage. Because it's not all rainbows and butterflies mm -hmm. and everybody shit stinks. And it's important that they grow up knowing that. Well, Justin, Emily, you shared a lot of good stuff uh, over the past hour. So I appreciate you giving us the time. Justin, I appreciate you bringing us this book and Emily, you're rolling it as well. Uh, we will this book link exist without her. This yeah. book would not exist without Emily. Yeah. Talk about that. This book exists because of the mirror and mm. the woman that she is pushing me to be a better man so I can become a better human. Doesn't Emily, exist without her. unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to talk about Ama, but she Emily does have a company called Ama, which is all about celebrating honest motherhood. Um, it is going really well. It's a lifestyle brand for mamas. So That's our cool. mission and our passion is to support mamas in their transformation because motherhood, as you guys know, is it's definitely super easy. transformation. It's so oh, easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we have everything yeah. we need. We have all the support yeah. that we could possibly need. So yeah. I was gonna say I'm I'm in the thick of it, so I'm gonna check it out. So I'm please do. I'm 28 weeks pregnant with the worst allergies in the world and you obviously can't take anything. So congratulations. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we could have you on for a part two. Uh, but we appreciate um your time. 
you mm-hmm. want to listen to Justin actually read this book himself, he's the narrator uh, of of the book, so you can get that it's on. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. Fall asleep to your voice, but um, <laughs> we will link information on on that down below, as well as things like Justin's TED Talk and uh, Justin and Emily's proposal. But Justin and Emily, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank, thank you, thank you for, so thank much you both for having for creating us. the space for us. It's really sweet. It's important work yeah. you guys are doing. Yes, thank you. Thank you.